Welcome to the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies, where there's always another secret. Welcome to another episode of the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies. This is episode 66, and today is September 21st, 2020. I'm Bill, and I am joined, as always, by my autumnal co-hosts, Amy and Jordan. Welcome, guys. Hello. Hello. I have a cold, uh, if you couldn't you, tell. You, you, you understand autumnal, right? No, I don't, actually. Mm-hmm. Because it's <laughs> the last day of summer. Is it? Oh. Autumn begins I... tomorrow. Well, if I'd when read you're trapped the word, in the, that would have made more sense. When you're in the, trapped in the basement, all things start to see the same. It's just Jordan, I'm drunk. Like your circumstances, or you're going to be trapped in there more. <laughs> the beatings will continue until morale until improves. improves. Yes. <laughs> Uh, before we get started, I do want to remind our listeners that the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies is not a spoiler-free podcast. That means if there is something in the Cosmere you haven't read and are worried about hearing spoilers, you might want to go read those first, then come back and join the discussion, particularly right now as we are going through the as-yet-unpublished Rhythm of War, which will be released um, on November 17th, but Brandon is releasing early chapters on Tor.com. Tonight, yeah, we're talking about chapter six territory. and seven. Yeah, this is like unpublished spoilers. <laughs> yes. So if you listen to the podcast recordings or you watch the videos on YouTube, we do want to remind you that you can join us and interact with us live via chat as we record each episode at www.twitch.tv slash innkeepers table. Again, slash innkeepers table, because I can speak like a cognizant human being, I promise. We record episodes of the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies every other Monday night, starting at 7.30 p.m. Pacific Time, 10.30 p.m. Eastern. So please join us, take an active part of the discussion, distract us, amuse us, make us feel good about ourselves. Tell us that we're pretty. Praise the pictures that I put up. It's so nice. Amy does put up good pictures. You should pay attention (laughs) to those as well. Mm -hmm. I, for one, won't bag. I will demand you do these things. (laughs) Uh, Before we jump into the discussion, we do want to remind you of our huge announcement from last week. Two weeks from tonight, on October 5th, we will have Isaac Stewart, Brandon's creative director at Dragonsteel, as a guest on the podcast. We're going to talk about a variety of topics, from the Cosmere to his work creating art and coordinating design for Brandon's books, to some of the projects that he's been doing on his own. You do not want to miss this. And if you have questions you want us to ask him while he's on the show, please send them in a short email to Cosmere Studies at gmail.com and include the word Isaac in the subject line of the email. We really want you there. It's going to be awesome. And I, guys, I'm seriously looking forward to this. As well we should, because he's cool. He's yes. really cool. Mm-hmm. And he's got a cool voice. Like if you uh, if you've paid attention to Brandon's streams, he comes on every so often, and I hear his voice. His voice is a little bit Brandon esque, actually. Hmm. Like it's not quite like Brandon's voice, but it sounds very similar. It's really interesting. <laughs> is this the work relationship version of marriage where they start looking like each other? <laughs> what? I don't want to know. No, I can I guarantee just, I don't I look really, like my husband. <laughs> really don't want to know. <laughs> Um, The Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies is made possible by the support of our listeners and patrons. Our show will continue to be free, but if you want to help us out, you can head over to patreon.com slash Cosmere Studies. Even pledging a couple dollars per episode will really help us out as we work to continue to improve the show. Patrons get immediate access to our Discord channel where you can talk about the show and the Cosmere with other listeners. It's a great community. We've got a lot of great discussions. You get early access to bonus episodes. You get exclusive access to other bonus content. It really is just worth it because it's awesome. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Not to mention the tinfoil hat theories. (laughs) Oh, we've had some fun ones going on. Whenever there's a new book coming out. (laughs) Oh, man. There's so many. Yeah. Ugh. Ah, so we ready to dive in, guys? I guess. To another yeah. two chapters? 
Let's do yeah. this. Let's do some so, wine tasting with Eli, as I said in the Instagram. No post. wine. <laughs> no. Um, so just as a reminder, Brandon is releasing chapters of Rhythm of War leading up to its release each week on November 17th. He's doing that on tour.com. So if you want to read along, keep up with us on that, you'll want to check that out. They also have a read along discussion mm. of people at tour talking about these chapters. So there's some really cool insight over there as well. So first, before we dive in, my favorite part, the epigrams. Um, Jordan, do you want to give us our first one? Yes, I, of course, have it open because I did, I did not put you on the Where spot. I promise. Do you want me to do the first one and Jordan do the second? Let's I, do that. OK, I am pissed. I totally had this open. somewhere, <laughs> And now okay. I don't know where it went. My computer well, you find me. it and then I will I will read the first one before my voice goes out. So with a captured spren, you may begin designing a proper fabrile. It is a closely guarded secret of Arbor Fabrians that spren, when trapped, respond to, a, to different types of metals in different ways. A wire housing for the fabrile, called a cage, is essential to controlling the device. And then the next one, which... Oh, this one. I read this and I got a little bit of chills because... This is where things get juicy. This is where it starts to cross over. The two metals of primary significance are zinc and brass, which allow you to control expression strength. Zinc wires touching the gemstone will cause the spren inside to more strongly manifest, while brass will cause the spren to withdraw and its power dim. Remember that a gemstone must be properly infused following the spren's capture. Drilled holes in gemstones are ideal for proper use of cage wires, so long as you don't crack the structure and risk release of the spren. Okay, so the first obvious connection to anybody who's read Mistborn (laughs) is zinc and brass. Mm. Jordan, why don't you remind us what zinc and brass do in Mistborn? Oh, nothing. No big deal, really. Uh, They only use zinc for, uh, you know, uh, rioting. I suddenly, I was going to say ruining, (laughs) and that was not the word. Rioting and uh, brass for soothing. And yeah. Mm. This is this, this is cool for a couple reasons. Obviously, the one to one is very interesting, um, mm-hmm. but I think it's one, it's something that I think actually tells us more about Skadriel than it does uh, Roshar. Um, in that, one of the questions that we had about Skadriel's Skadriel's a one hundred percent planned world by shards, um, mm-hmm. as opposed to Roshar, which is pre shattering originally. Mm-hmm. Now, there's definite mm-hmm. influence post shattering as well but right so the question is why did ruin and uh preservation make the powers do what they do and it, if that's the case and the answer is it doesn't seem like they did that this is a natural cause mm-hmm. of choosing the metals to be the the unlocking mechanism for uh for these powers because there is some one to one and it has some more mm-hmm. interesting implications like okay now what happens if you use other metals that we know what they do mhm well cuz if mm-hmm. you if you look at the uh the alamancy chart zinc and brass are mental pulling and pushing mm-hmm. um metals and so if you are pulling on a mental aspect something on a cognitive aspect a sprint, as it were. Like it's 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 just it's it's absolutely fascinating that it ties in that way. Well, and and it, you know Brandon was giggling as he wrote this. He's like, they're gonna love it. <laughs> well, and it's not here, but uh, we know like the the sensor fabriel that we saw in uh I think it was Way of Kings actually. Um I think it was the first time we met uh oh, she's now getting the wander sale. What's her bucket's name? Rissen. 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 The first time we see her, that her uh, her Babs had that sensor fabriel, and I believe oh, it yeah. used bronze, which is used for yeah. seeking. I didn't even mm-hmm. think about that. I, I didn't I either. I, I went that. looking up stuff and found that people had made this connection. Hmm. I hadn't thought about that at all. Yeah, and so... Thank you, smart people of the internet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, where we just get to, you know, pick up what they've... <laughs> Dro- dropped just, for us. It's nice. Sprinkle, sprinkle, and then scoop it up and use it. Everyone okay. loves sprinkles. Um. Anyway, the uh, 
So it's inter- so it implies that there is they don't have they didn't have quite the phenomenal cosmic power to shape things fully the way they wanted to because mm-hmm. they're working within a world that already had some form of rules which actually makes sense you yes. know it's like they, they they don't break the laws they just have additional laws that they can manipulate yeah and so this is just one of those th- this is one of those things that the reason it's so much more fun to read the all Risen. of the cosmere is no, not. But I like what you did there. That's you know, I, w- I wasn't gonna laugh all the way, but there was a hearty like hmm, inside my soul. Uh, no, the uh, the thing that it's just you don't get this sort of depth if you're only reading Stormlight, right? And this is yeah. what Brandon's so good at. This none of this is required. Mm-hmm. Knowing zinc and brass have magical properties in a different magic system don't Does, help you, you know, in any way, but yeah. It's just, mm, you know, that just really adds something that, to it. It's like a, a little bit. It's like good sea salt on uh, on chocolate. Oh, uh, just to offer that to my also, husband, he hates it. <laughs> it's also why I uh, I personally recommend reading the books in publication order, because Brandon reveals these things in a certain order, and it just sort of makes it flow properly to me. It's mm. just, it's just very satisfying. Yeah. And so people, some people disagree with me. I'm okay with that, but that's my personal preference. Yeah. I would just usually give the caveat of if they start with a laundress of, you know, this keep is reading first book and keep going. But th- yeah. Again, if a laundress is the only thing of his you've read, it feels much like it's still a really good book. Oh yeah. It's still a good book. It's just compared to the other ones. You're like, mm, I, I think the, the reason a laundress gets a bad rap is because a lot of people, don't read it first and then they come back to it and it's like this isn't as good as his other stuff yeah but yeah. if you read it before reading any of any of his other mm-hmm. stuff it's just like because that's the book that hooked me on brandon that's the first one i read and i was like this is amazing what else has he got at the same time i think it was wise for you to to get me started on mistborn mm-hmm. and there are de- definitely certain people who that is different you need to hook them a different way and yep. then it's all good so Let's start with, and let's, we're not going to go in the order everything happens in all the chapters again. We're going to split it into basically Shallan and then what's going on in Hearthstone. Yeah. So Shallan, first off, one thing I noticed <laughs> as we were reading, she referred to herself in her, in her own mind as the three. Which is creepy. And it's I'm like, not, uh... it's creepy, but it's also fascinating. Yeah. And because I mean, it's, it's, I think it was a previous chapter where she talks about like, Oh no, it's a later one. Sorry, I will talk about that later. But oh yeah, chapter. that's that's later. Well, th- okay. yeah, that's a different. Sorry, almost a but, spoiler. Spoiler. But just referring to herself as the three, ca- capital T, you know. Yes. <laughs> um, capital T, capital T. And so it's like there are three different personalities in there, but they make up a singular entity, which is called the three. Mm-hmm. And I just thought that was kind of an interesting little touch that Brandon added in there. Yeah. I am very intrigued to see what path Shalong g- goes on over the course of this book. And it's mm. one of those just like, it could be a really good and healing path, or it could be a really, really bad path. And I don't know which one Brandon is planning for us, but this is book four in a book five series, mm. and it's not going to end in a happy place. No, no, it will not. We were discussing that yesterday here, just the fact that we're mentally preparing for this book to end Empire Strikes Back style. Oh, I'm not thinking Empire Strikes Back. Well, yeah, Empire Strikes Back style. I was worried it was going to end Revenge of the Sith style. (laughs) Because we knew that wasn't going to be a happy ending. Adelaide, you're breaking my heart. Oh, Oh, don't. Oh, don't go there. No. (laughs) Oh, no. You've just made several people in our Discord incredibly happy. You know that. Oh man! The prequel memes are. Why leaking. won't she heal? She's lost <laughs> the will to live. There's also anyway. other theories I've heard about that, but anyway, we're moving on. So yes. About what? Move. I won't. No. Okay. <laughs> um, Padme stuff. Don't worry about it. So anyway, speaking of Adolin, Adolin pops up, sword swinging. You know, just like the wonderful meathead that he is. She um, can hear him at first, though, and she doesn't yep. see him, but she hears him. But that's what I'm saying. Is like he shows up, and he's <laughs> he's he, he's just. You know, he basically sees a, a problem and he says, "What? how do we fix problems? We punch them. With the sword. 
And as much as he means well, he's kind of messing up Shallan's plan. So, of course, the Sons of Honor flee into the hidden tunnel. And Shallan's just like, don't leave me here. Don't leave me. She has a moment where she has to think about it and go, mm, no, I need to follow this through. And they need to keep, I need yeah. to get to ELI instead of losing all the progress we made. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's also one of those things that you wonder if it wasn't his his wife that was down there if he'd be able to yeah. keep a cooler head about it and mm -hmm. just trust his yeah. operative to to do it but when it's you know the person you've married it's like yeah. it's a little, it's a little i'm gonna be a little more protective and, than normal and it's not just married they're they're still like gushy over each other and so oh yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah they're still in the honeymoon oh. and uh but yeah, so he comes in swinging, and, and of course patterns with him leading the way, just gleeful of as as can be. <laughs> yep. Um, and I like how she throughout the the scenes she like almost summons pattern to be like, "Here's your homing beacon." Yeah, it's really a cool concept. She doesn't summon him because she doesn't, she doesn't need like, him yet, but she needs to let yeah. him know where she is, mm -hmm. which kind of surprised me. I thought that that would kind of be a natural, a natural thing, thing that but he I mean, would know. yeah. But I mean, through caves and stuff like that, it would probably mm -hmm. make it harder. Well, I wonder just, if, it's, it, if it's different depending on the kind of sprint as well. It might be because he doesn't seem to fly the way Sil does. He tends to right. go over surfaces. And so mm -hmm. I wonder, like, even though we've mm -hmm. seen that he can hover in the air, we don't see him tend to float through the air. Right. Yeah. Um, now, I don't know if it's because he can't really fly. I have a feeling that he probably can. But the nature of being a cryptic, they tend to skulk more. Mm. Um, but I could see that. I could also because it's well. She's also a wind or not a wind sprint, but related to wind sprint, which yeah. But but even okay. Shalon or Shalon, oh my goodness, Sill doesn't go through solid material. She seems to have to you know behave somewhat around walls and stuff because she talks about mm -hmm. fitting through things and. Mm. Yeah, I could have sworn we did see a sprint sometime go through a wall, but now I can't even remember. But where it's it like was. if there is any sort of of opening she can fit into it yeah mm, maybe that's what it is and so it might she be can. just a case of he needs the homing beacon so he can figure out how to get there hmm. yeah i don't know of course then that? if she summoned him he would just immediately be there yeah and so yeah the the whole spring radiant relationship is very very interesting and it's one that i'm just like how much of this have you actually worked out, Brandon? And how much are you just like, um, explain a little bit really, really, really detailed and they'll assume that I know what I'm doing. <laughs> it's great. I mean, it worked um, my entire career, so. So Shalon, it's really, really interesting to watch as she slips in and out of these, her, oh, yeah. her aspects again. Like she, she was doing it earlier and it's just sort of, she goes through them very quickly. I actually was reading a word of Brandon and apparently that's kind of based on some interviews he's made with people who have uh, dissociative identity disorder. Mm. Um, and apparently he was kind of leaning away from it before this book. And as he realized where he needed to get Shalon, he was like, I'm kind of take, I've been kind of taking the easy way and say, you know, and sort of hand waving and saying, this is magic. This is, different and he's like but i think i need to actually lean in and do the research and make it work um basically saying if she wasn't a radiant she would still have developed did in some way mm. um but because of the nature of her her light order and everything it's manifesting in a very different way and and has some interesting side effects yeah um, but it's just very interesting because, like, they're even talking about who should take control in this situation. Like, it's almost like they really are a committee. Yeah, and they're always assessing, no, no, so-and-so should take this part. And so they're it's not like that. Shalon says, I'll let Vale take over, I'll let Radiant take over. They have a discussion. You know, like, and at one point, yeah. Radiant or Vale says to her, like, are you sure you want to do this? I, I can do this. <laughs> I got this if you need me to take it. Yeah. yeah. And it's just it's it's really just absolutely fascinating. Mm -hmm. Um and at one point as they're figuring out Eli and looking at Sadius as well, as they're going through the tunnels and the and seeing exactly what Sadius had planned in his war camp, 
Vale sort of starts going through some of Shallan's memories. And she's like, oh, wow, he's not a blowhard. He was crafty. Mm, yep. Someone with a, d- a different um, viewpoint on it sees it, the, everything that he does in a very different light. Which is an interesting thing because, you know, Brandon does this a lot when he, t- he tells different events from different viewpoints. Mm. But this is from the same, the same character, viewpoint. but a different aspect of that yeah. character. It's a different viewpoint within who, who's already seen things. Mm. Yeah. And Eli finally shows herself. And she's so sad. She is not looking good. Yeah. Um, and that's when we find out that Vale not only plans to infiltrate and learn everything. Vale's just like, no, I'm going to kill her. <laughs> no, no. She, she, she's she going to die. Gonna, I'm, I'm an assassin die. and she's going to die. Yeah. Vale definitely likes to, to cut through knots mm-hmm. instead of trying to untie them. That's probably her... the the. The time when she liked Adolin most, when she found out what he did to Sadie. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also the part that I love that she plans to to do this, and it's like that's adorable. I love it when couples have shared hobbies. <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> so when Sirlan sees her, she she bows to her and calls her my queen. And Eli's reaction is really interesting because she's like, I, I don't want to be queen. I, I have no that, yeah. intention to be queen. Mm-hmm. And, of course, Shallan and Vale don't really trust that. They're just like, oh, this is plausible deniability, essentially. Yeah. You know, this is where she can say, no, I'm just a patriot. Whereas claiming to want to be queen would be full, absolute full treason. Blown, yeah. Mm-hmm. And so. Do you believe her? I don't know. At this point, possibly. Based on she's, based she's on how so I, I feel down. like this is the most candid we've ever seen Eli. The, she, she's so broken. Yeah, I I believe her completely. Um, mm-hmm. I, part of it is I'm going through Oathbringer again right now, and I am so I'm getting a lot of the flashback chapters, mm-hmm. and I happen to just get through. Uh, it's the dinner scene where ELA and Navani show up and they're basically start telling Dalinar about, uh, about Evie. Uh, Evie. And mm. they're just like, you know, you should, and, and they're plotting and scheming. And it's mm-hmm. one thing that's always hard to remember with Sadius and ELA is the fact that they really were loyal to Gavilar. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And it's one of those things where I think I think it's easy for us to forget it because we see them constantly trying to thwart Dalinar. Mm-hmm. Well, and essentially she doesn't want to be queen, no. but she does want to be regent. Yeah, I you know, think. She... Yeah, I I almost wonder if she still had the willpower to really be regent if she ended up being regent. Well, I think at this point, no. Sad and gone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that at the beginning of it, she probably did really plan to do it. And then her, her movement is still going and they're going strong. But I feel like she's just kind of wasting away. Well, I think, This I is think really so. not expected, how I was expecting the our encounters with Eli. In this oh, yeah. To, I mean, you go. always see her as strong and powerful and crafty. And then she's mm-hmm. weak and sad. And well, and, and it's, a, it's a little bit of, uh, of Worf effect at the time. Because we've no we've been told what a great you know crafty thinker she is but unfortunately we haven't really gotten mm-hmm. to see it mm-hmm. um so yeah. this is a little more we've been uh told more than shown which is a mm-hmm. rarity for brandon but it, i think the thing that makes this work uh is the fact that what the, at least for me it seems to me the reason she seems so broken is i think she realizes how cornered she is mm-hmm. and so she had all these plans and she's suddenly realizing how much out not in control she is, that the ghost bloods have her cornered at every turn, and that even if everything went according to plan, she would actually only be executing someone else's scheme. Yeah. And Shalon starts noticing mm-hmm. just how much the ghost bloods have been playing, even her. Oh, yeah, which she does not take well to. She's like, mm-hmm. no, we're not going to kill her because I don't want to do yeah. what they want now apparently they haven't outright lied to her but they they've implied left. quite a bit yeah heavy implications um so eli decides to have a fun little chat with shallan about why and they're like dancing around each other it's really a very well done dialogue 
because they're both sort of implying that the other is doing something that they're not and, and or that they're not saying but there's something that each of them is missing about the other as well mm-hmm. um like eli already knows that sholan has come to kill her she just thinks that she's been sent by the ghost bloods and not dalinar <laughs> yep um and, oh and, gosh, and in, the in that she's, she's actually correct Dalinar mm-hmm. did not send her to kill them. The ghost bloods did. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, Dalinar the ghost wants was, her to. So, wants her to it, so it's, she, it's fun because she's right while not actually being right. Yeah. The ghost bloods didn't send her to kill her, but they manipulated essentially Vale to want to kill her. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's it. Oh gosh. The ghost bloods are absolutely terrifying and you know that there's something deeper in the Cosmere aspect of it. And Kelsier's tied in. Kelsier's connected somehow. Oh man. I don't. (laughs) Jordan's just like, let it begin. Let it begin. That'd be so weird. Also, when they're talking about wine, I love that Brandon has been doing this on, particularly on Roshar with the whole words mean different things on Roshar. Like every chicken or every bird is every co- referred to chicken. as chicken. And in this, every alcohol is referred to as wine. They talk about grain alcohols, you know, being like the horn eater varieties or and, your and, stuff. and stuff. Yeah. And that still counts as quote wine. Wine. Everything. It's is just, wine. it's, a, it's an interesting little touch. I thought it was kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Well, the other thing that I love is we know exactly how potent horn eater white is. <laughs> thanks to Shalon's Ooh, experimentation. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's the kind it'll make you go blind with a with a taste. Well, what was I think when she uh, she like drinks it the first time the the bartender's like like you're not a horde eater and it's like it, it it's like it cleans it it's like it peels off lacquer off a table really good though or something like that. It reminds <laughs> me of the scene in uh, Parks and Recreation with with Ron's mom and Tammy one. And Leslie decides to to join in and drink to free Ron from the, because they have like a drinking contest. And Leslie takes a drink. And she's like, "This was a mistake. This, this was a mistake." I, I I was and she can't even talk anymore. And so the two of them are battling. And then Ron comes up, picks up like the whole jug, and just downs the whole thing. Oh man! And like that's just what that scene where Shalon takes the horny to white reminds me of. Mm-hmm. Um, but apparently this is like, I don't understand the significance. Brandon brought it up in the book. So there's some sort of significance, but I don't, haven't caught it that she offers her a clear one. And so Shalon assumes that it's a grain alcohol, but it has a fruity taste. I don't know. Well, one thing we do know from, uh, from, from Shalon's drinking escapades, I just got done with those chapters, um, <laughs> is that a lot of the alcohols get their colors added after. Right. Mm-hmm. And so the fact that it's clear to me, the significance of is you don't know what it is. Mm-hmm. Or, it, or maybe it's like moonshine kind of like that is not. Yeah. Cause some, cause known. some are clear, but it's one of these things where you're having this battle of wits. I, mm. to me, it I think this is down to you and it is down to me. <laughs> I think it's a significant of she's trying to see if she'll trust her type of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's interesting because Eli, you know, she's like once I'm, she says, once I'm dead, don't let them search my rooms before you do look for the rarest vintage. It is exotic. And it's just sort of like, and we don't, well, find why would you trust until... me with that? <laughs> yeah. But she's just, she basically, it's just, I don't trust anyone. You're here. And I know you're not, like, you seem to not be, like, they fooled you, so clearly you're not fully with them. Yeah. And so I'm going to trust you with this. It's just, it's really, it's really her cryptic best and bet really interesting. For, for somebody other than just, like, anybody to do it. Mm-hmm. So anyway, Adolin finally shows up with the cavalry. <laughs> and yep. he the first thing he says to her is, which one are you? <laughs> mm-hmm. His relationship with the three is very, very interesting. <laughs> that would be very, very interesting. This is a healthy relationship. 
But <laughs> but the thing is, all three of them are honest. And so it's yeah. just like she she just says, I'm Shalon. And mm-hmm. it, I, and it's, know, it's, I think it's, 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 is it in this one or is it later that he, later. she comments? It's later. I keep thinking about stuff that happens. Are in you like talking the about in the chapter. carriage? It was more about what he he's able to tell, kind of. Yeah, the I think that's in the so carriage. That's later. later. That's so, a later chapter. Uh, I keep getting um, them mixed up. But yeah, it's just, yeah, which one are you? How, what would that be like to? Oh man, that to would be like tough. meet the person that you love and have married, <laughs> and have to ask, "Are you the person I married right now?" Yeah, that I mean, would like be technically, really he married all three, and he but Shalon is the one partially. that he loves. Yeah, Radiant appears to to love him as well, but mm. it's just it's very it's not- different. It, it doesn't the, seem like as puppy dog loved kind of like as, as Shalon and him have. But at the same time, Radiant. it's really cool seeing just how accepting he is. He's very this. supportive. Like it, it, it's that can be an easy situation. And it's just, oh, no, I think that speaks very well of Adolin mm-hmm. that he's able to do that. I mean, he um, probably saw he wasn't he's the. The older sibling, so he did see how his mom and dad interacted, and his mom was very loving and caring. Yes. But, and I think Dalinar was never like brutally mean to, to Evie, but I'm sure Adolin probably wanted to have a better marriage than mm-hmm. that when he had a marriage. Yeah. No, it just it speaks so. very well of him. And, mm-hmm. I, you know, there are a lot of people who have very mixed feelings about Adolin. And the way that he interacts with Shallan is just one of those absolute pet the dog mm-hmm. moments. I love Adolin for this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it seems um, like most of the people who don't like Adolin, it's because he's privileged. He grew hmm. up privileged. And so, like, that that's what I've noticed, at least. Yeah, but he is very down to earth in spite of oh, all yeah. that. Oh, well, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mo- See, the thing I've noticed, the people who don't like Adolin is they ship her with Kaladin. And that's what they're really mad about. So, so obviously you can't, you can't like the other possible ship. And I just, but, yeah, I disagree. Yeah. But I, um, and I mean, ship who you're going to ship. Mm-hmm. That's fine. That's what fanfic is for. My, my just, weird ship right is, that. is Kaladin and Leshwe, <laughs> but we'll talk about that later. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, that, uh, but that ruins my Kaladin. Yes. No slap, slap, kiss ship. Oh gosh. Oh, no. Not to mention they're like, uh-uh. there's like 15 years difference in their ages. <laughs> Eh. Anyway, um, so they take Eli into custody, and apparently Shalon has really grown to trust Ishna. It's um, been a year. She's the one so. who who she recruited, you know, back during the Horn Eater White episode of the previous book. Um, and so she talks to her, and then suddenly as they're talking, or not as they're talking, like, suddenly after Shalon is doing other stuff, they hear a sound and Eli's dead. She's just dead. Mm-hmm. Which again, not how I expected Eli to be portrayed in this book. I'm, I'm thinking yeah. there's going to be a lot more, you know, hidden spider woman behind the scenes, you know, plucking the web of everything going on. And they just take her out at the beginning. And it's yeah. just like, mm-hmm. okay, I, uh, Brandon, you've subverted my expectations. Now stop it. Yeah, for uh, brute, for the over under on how long she would have lasted of this book, I definitely had at least until Act Four. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's like, oh, oh no, longer. she ain't getting halfway through Act One. <laughs> like she's not going to make it through the preview chapters. <laughs> Which makes you go, okay, who's going to be the other big bad to, or the the other minor bad to kind of take her place? The Ghost Bloods. <laughs> I think it's the ghost bloods. They're they're gonna. Oh gosh, there's something messed up going on there. But that's a harder one to deal with because they're mm-hmm. so sneaky. Yeah. So Shalon start goes off and talks to to um. I just blank Ishna. Ishna. Um, you know she's just like, so you you know she didn't eat poison, right? She's like, well, they're, and they're talking about black bean, which isn't black bean the same poison that that's Kaladin what, was going to take? Yeah, that yeah, was she, Well, she gives the whole speech about how you have to dry it out, and that's exactly mm-hmm. what Kaladin had been doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the more yeah. potent it gets. Yeah. And, um, and she, you know, it, it's interesting. Ishin is talking about, she's like, well, you know, if, if it's taken intravenously, then you can die really quickly. Oh. <laughs> 
And, and Shalon's been yeah. studying it, so she knows some parts of that, too. Yeah. And so Shalon immediately stops the men that Adolin's sending to search Eli's rooms because Eli gave her that cryptic message about looking mm-hmm. for the rarest vintage. and Yeah. And she wants to search the room first. And dun, dun, dun. dun. One thing that's interesting is, because it's near the end, uh, where Ishna and her are talking, mm-hmm. uh, I know, I know a little about Blackbane, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, you know, they have that thing. But it was before that that Vatha actually said she must have taken poison Blackbane. He said this before Ishna and Shalon hmm. even have the conversation. Well, because I think he probably recognized it from the, the her foaming mouth. Or yeah, because I think the way that. she reacted to it was common for Blackbane. But it's, it's mm-hmm. interesting that he's... Because he's not trained the way that... Uh, Ishna oh, they is. Are. And Shalon. I mean, no. he was. But he, he knew. Well, I mean, he, he's had a year, so we don't know what he's trained. Yeah, but it was the fact that he doesn't so easily tells me. It, t- it tells me that he's been either studying or we're going to find stuff out about him that mm-hmm. he's a little more than a deserter in my mind. Yeah. We don't it's know very what, possible. Yeah. Um, I thought I thought you were saying that you think he might have been the one to poison her. Oh, he might be as well. Like I won't. Uh, I won't. That I don't. Out. That the, I don't buy. The problem is, it's who had the opportunity to poison her. It's a it small Adolin list. Had, Adolin yeah. had soldiers holding him, or was it Shalon's men? I thought it was Adolin's soldiers, but I think I, it was Adolin's soldiers. I'm not sure though. Yeah, that's the thing. So it's. The one thing I don't remember from reading this, did we ever find out if they if Ishna was able to search the body and if she found any needles or anything like that? I don't remember. I think she found a prick, but not any But she any didn't find the needles. needles. Well, I mean, yeah, yeah. but ELA was dead. I'm asking if she found needles. I don't, I don't think, think so. I don't think she found no, needles. No, my joke. No. Okay, it didn't work at all. I'm completely missing the joke. <laughs> Sorry. I said, she found a prick, and I'm, e- ELA's already oh. dead. <laughs> wow. Oh. Okay. Wow. Anyway. I, was, I was really proud of it. <laughs> it's just like, oh, no. It went over everyone's head. <laughs> I did uh. a terrible delivery. It's horrible. <sighs> anyway, moving on. <laughs> all right. So, meanwhile, while all of the uh, cloak and dagger stuff's been going on back at the war camps, mm. Kaladin's been breaking stuff in Hearthstone. <laughs> <laughs> I like the line. It's you know the hardest thing in the world for Kaladin to do was nothing. Oh yeah. And so you know, Sigzol right now is fighting Leshui, and Kaladin's just sitting here. He's like, I can't go in and help him because apparently yeah. because the uh, the Heavenly Ones and the Windrunners kind of have this very tenuous honor system between mm-hmm. them that they've kind of developed where. They'll challenge each other to one-on-one battles. And they're like, they're testing themselves against each other. Yeah. Um, and actually, Navani and uh, Rushu comment on this later. We'll talk about it when we get to that. But but it's just a very interesting system that's going on. You know, because remember, Kaladin spared that one heavenly one yeah, in his fight earlier, earlier mm-hmm. which will come back. Very importantly, um, because Brandon gives us one of the most emotional fake outs that made me <laughs> very upset when uh, when Leshwe stabs Sigzel. And I was just like, oh, don't you take our little our little no. world singer from us. No, that's not OK. <laughs> I'm not OK with mm-hmm. him scaring us with Sigzel. But then at the last second, she pulls the spear out. Gives <laughs> Kaladin a very pointed look, looks over at the the heavenly one that Kaladin spared earlier, and Kaladin immediately says, drop your spear and bow to her. <laughs> and Sigzel, like, yeah, you know, Sigzel is understandably a bit confused, what with having his lifeblood being sucked out moments before. Yeah, but because they have those, know, he, those things on their spears that do, that suck. The that light. sucks all the stormlight out of them. Mm-hmm. Um. But he immediately does and takes him out of combat. And he says, go back to the fourth bridge, sit out the rest of the battle. And it's just yeah. like, okay, the stakes have lowered, but in a very, very interesting way. Yeah. And it's just like how, you know, it, that Odium wouldn't be pleased with this. But. No, no, he'd probably like the other ones more that are on the ground. Mm-hmm. 
Well, it's it's something that's very interesting about the whole thing. It's clear that for them, this is they they want the contest that they want to be able to test themselves. They want mm-hmm. to see what they can achieve. And if you start doing, you know, actual battle tactics where mm-hmm. you're trying to flank, you're trying to get out numbers and out maneuver. It's no longer about your martial prowess, but it's about, about your, your strategy. Strate- yeah, your strategic yeah. prowess. And mm. that's not what they're interested in. And so the mm-hmm. reason it's tenuous is both know that we can, it's a very high stakes game of dodgeball that, uh, that mm-hmm. Sigzel yeah. just got tagged out on or whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it's one of those things where, okay, but we don't want to ruin this because this is a lot of fun. So and and we die less, which is appreciated. Yeah. So let's do these these made up rules, but the moment someone crosses the line, the fact that it is war will take over, and so it's just so yeah. much of it is they're just trying to don't ruin the fun. I mean, this is war, but it doesn't have to be war, war, right? Well, yeah. there's a and there's a very distinct sense of honor. It, but it, on both sides, which I think is interesting, you know, because there is a comparison with each um, type of fused to a different order of radiant and wind runners bond with honor spread. Mm-hmm. And so it's just it's, it's a very interesting parallel there. Yeah. Um, and later on, we actually see a little bit more about Leshwe and I'm I'm very interested in learning more about Leshwe. Mm-hmm. It's going to be interesting with all the scenes with Venli and Eshonai's viewpoints. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so meanwhile, all this is going on. Navani is directing the refugees <laughs> aboard the fourth bridge, and she just, she knows how to direct people. It's really cool she to does. watch. Like, you know, we talked about it in the prologue, how she's just telling people exactly where to go and just organizing them, and she's doing the same thing here on the fourth bridge. Um, but mm-hmm. more in concert with Dalinar in this one, rather than, you know, Gavilar is just like, throw a wrench in the gears, watch it explode and let her pick up the pieces, which she does very well. Dalinar is, they're, they're working kind of together. It's really cool to see. Well, she, cause mm-hmm. she, she's a logistical genius and it's, mm-hmm. it's clear that not only does she have a talent for it, she has yeah. owned it over the years. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, yeah. Whereas men like Dalinar and Gavilar, they're not about logistics. They hire people to handle logistics. Mm-hmm. Now the problem for Gavilar is that Gavilar just abused that fact that he well, had he a logistical it. genius who would handle all this stuff. And he, he was it, probably even a little bit threatened by it. Yeah. I mean, based on the way that he actually treated her. Yeah. But Dalinar has always had a very good relationship with the people that he, I mean, it, it, for the, his army, it's his, his you know, uh, the people who report to him. We saw that mm-hmm. with, uh, what's his name? Uh, the Bowman. Oh mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. I'm blanking on his name, but yeah. Oh, oh goodness. It starts with a T or something, doesn't it? I don't remember. Is it anyway? Thunder? Way back. Anyway, you, you see, he has he has a great appreciation for people who are good at things that he's not, and always has. Even uh-huh. when he was the ultimate meathead, he yeah. absolutely <laughs> was fascinated. He recognized talent. Yeah, and mm-hmm. and loved it. And mm-hmm. wanted to and wanted to use it, not abuse it, but actually use it properly. Mm-hmm. And we see that it's it's this continuing to old age where he wants to improve. And now that he's yeah. no longer on the battlefield, he's trying to improve in the other ways, and he's trying to he's trying to learn from Navani. Yeah, the thing about Dalinar is he wasn't just a good soldier; he was a good general. Yeah, or he is a good general. Mm-hmm. And he, so he recognizes talent and knows how to direct it properly. Mm-hmm. And I just, I love seeing the two of them actually working together in concert because it's just, they're, they are a true power couple. <laughs> yeah. So now, um, Navani sees Renarin and there's a, we, we get an interesting perspective from her on how Renarin is because, you know, she's, she sees him, um, entertaining the children with like by mm-hmm. summoning a ball of light and um, he kind of juggles it and it's cute yeah it's really and she cute. sort of reflects on the relationship between renarin and gliss and gliss being a corrupted sprin but renarin saying that gliss is trustworthy and just it, it's but, really just interesting 
but there's like different aspects of how his powers manifest mm-hmm. too. Like that well, he can't do light weaving. Right. And the other truth watchers, and there are other truth watchers that they've recruited mm-hmm. now. Um, other truth watchers can light weave, but Renarin can't. He can just summon this globe of light. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just, it's really interesting to see. And I, I'm looking forward to learning more about, because Gliss is one of the most fascinating little tidbits that I want to. And we don't, and we don't know much about Gliss. All we've gotten is little at all. bits from, from Renarin. Mm-hmm. But I, yeah, I, I love seeing that Renarin is just, he's entertaining the children. He's being cute. It, it's, it's very, it reminds me of, uh, of wit uh, animating the, or the awakening the, the, the little straw doll mm-hmm. um, it, in Oathbringer. Yeah, that's, it's oh, just, that's it's fantasy. another sort of pet the dog moment that I, that I love. Mm-hmm. And then, um, and then we meet Rushu. <laughs> <laughs> Rushu's That's okay. Funny. I've liked Rushu every time we've met her. <laughs> Where else have we met her? I'm blanking. We, we, she, she's I, been I remember she's her. been part of uh, Devani's retinue for quite okay. a while. Quite a while. I just didn't and, remember her. And Devani, well, but. Devani's the reason she sticks out to me is Devani has commented a couple times on how Rushu's like a genius, but mm-hmm. insanely scatterbrained. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and one, I totally love brilliant but scatterbrained characters mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and the fact that she's right like we because we we see it from kaladin's perspective and we see that rushu's picking up on the the details and with, yeah. with the with the wind runners and the yeah. heavenly ones and but it's yeah. because yeah. it's because Ru- rushu in a lot of ways is sort of like dalinar in that you never get half of them you get mm-hmm. all of them mm-hmm. rushu's yeah. attention never goes halfway to one thing whereas navani a e r i e the logistics person is always got her attention in 10 different directions and she mm-hmm. can juggle those things. She's like, come on, Rishu focus. And she's like, well, she is focusing just, just on that. Just <laughs> not on this. The it's thing she's not sort of like to. A, a mild form of ADD. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, because you either can't focus or you hyper focus. And that's sort of what's going on here is like, and, and she's calling out to Navani. She's just like, Something funny's going on, and and Navani's just like it's normal, you know. She sort of d- dismisses it, <laughs> and that's the other thing is you say she's brilliant but scatterbrained, and that type of person often tends to get dismissed. Mm. She's very much like, like Renarin oh, in this regard, mm-hmm. but re- with Renar- Renarin's more socially awkward, whereas yeah. Rushu is not really awkward socially, uh-huh. just like oh what, sorry, she's- I was totally thinking of something else. <laughs> I'm doing my thing, yeah. You know, there, there may be even be little aspects of Lightweaver in there because she's noticing patterns like crazy. Mm. You know, cause she's, yeah, and she and she's has... like, there, there seem to be a lot more Windrunners holding back than over. She's like, those are reserves. She's like, N- well, no, but... <laughs> <laughs> are they really? Yeah. yeah it's just, it, oh, I like Rushu a lot. Yeah. I'm not going to ship Rushu and Renarin together and no one can stop. <laughs> I love that. The R's. I, I have seen a few people in our Discord shipping, or maybe just one, shipping Rushu and uh, Kaladin. I'm just like, no. <laughs> Kal- <laughs> Kalishwiden. <laughs> uh, but of course, that's my, my crazy aluminum foil hat ship, not a full serious one. And then, of course, she's, she know, and Novani is noticing other things that are going on. She sees Rock um, handling the supplies, and more specifically, she sees Cord. Standing a little closer to Dalinar than she would normally need to. And she's just like, she's guarding him. You know, she, Bridge Four has sort does. of advanced <laughs> beyond this troop of bodyguards. But Kaladin's still got an eye on Dalinar. It's, it's really yeah. just a cool. And, and, and it's, sure, of course, what, what Navani would notice. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sure Kaladin kind of instilled that in everybody. And everybody just kind of was like, nope, okay, that's our responsibility. Yeah. We take care of it. I am very intrigued to learn more about Cord. She's been mentioned a couple of times. She was also mentioned in the in the Sill interlude, and I'm just like, I know, yeah. She's gonna be important. She's gonna be cool. We don't know how, but she's gonna be cool. She's got and so. Cool. Also, I think um, because in the interlude it mentions that she got her suit of shard plate from Amia. She that means that she's on uh, the Don or not the Don the Wander Sail, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, th- I mean, that's, if it's an Amia, possibly, I don't know at least possibly. So I'm wondering if she's going to be a major character in Wander Sail as well, or in Dawn. Does Wander Sail's ebook come out again? 
Dawn Shard. Um, it comes it's out like... in October, I believe. Oh. So we need to figure that one out. Everything. I is think so... the ebook. The ebook comes out in October, I think, and then like, yeah, they and don't I think know exactly and, and, and we'll need to do an episode on that before. Everything is so cramped for time. Yeah. Oh yep. my goodness. <laughs> yep. We're gonna be like. Don't you think of the podcasters, Brandon? <laughs> Well, to be I fair, not he, every pod, not every podcast actually picks up them apart as thoroughly as we have been. Um, I also, what was on one of his recent live streams, he actually talked about how he he would have ideally done Don Chart at a different time, but just mm-hmm. but it has to come out before. Out. Yeah, yeah, and, and by ideally, it's timing for him to write it, not timing yeah. for it to be released. This is when it needs to be released, though. It, yeah. it needs to come out before. So. Yeah. Although apparently it's also one that you don't necessarily need to read it. So you can read them in either order and, and they're only referring vaguely. So there's no major spoilers, but yeah. it does come between three and four. I think it's because of the Kickstarter that he, he partially was saying that it has to come out when it does. Mm-hmm. But. And then Dalinar does another Mr. Miyagi clap where he just claps and the music starts just oh. getting really tense. Mm-hmm. And opens up another perp- perpendicularity. Mm-hmm. And uh, Navani and starts interviewing him. Why? Because she's a scholar. And that's <laughs> what she does. And she makes sure that Rushu's writing down her notes about everything uh-huh. that she notices. Even though she's like, oh, well, there's already, Yasna already has the book. So I don't, you know. Well, because well, Rushu thinks it's just a matter of seeing the cognitive realm. Because Yasna has gone to the cognitive realm. And she knows better. And all. But... You know, Navani is trying to study also the perpendicularities itself and the fact that the perpendicularity reaches into a realm beyond the cognitive realm, which I think she's talking about the spiritual realm, correct? Mm. Yeah. Um, well, because that's where the power because, comes from. Because she wants to power your ethereal. Yes. Because there's a febrial that she doesn't understand. And that bothers And her. that is not okay. <laughs> so she needs to study it. And then Moa shows up. And that just, and, and, and it like, was, I love that it was Rushu that spotted it though. She's like, something's weird over there. Why is that Windrunner not like mm-hmm. doing anything? But she doesn't look close enough to notice what's off about him. But she does notice that there's something mm-hmm. off. About I love it. that Rushu notices it, but I even more love that we get this first introduction to Moash being there from Navani's perspective. Who is because pissed. this is the man who murdered her son. Yeah so interesting just uh-huh. the, the webs that are being woven between the, mm-hmm. the various characters and how they all intermesh well and with a lot of other authors that would have been just sort of swept aside but brandon explores it mm-hmm. and you know we don't know if that's going to be a big thing going forward but it was poignant to navani who was whose perspective we were seeing things from right then yeah. and so it made sense to dive into that mm-hmm. Oh, uh, 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 I feel bad for for Brandon's uh, agent Moshe because I th- <laughs> because there have been people who think that he's named after Moshe and Brandon's just like no, it's no. not named after him. No. That is a purely coincidence. That said, let's look at those recent contracts and make sure that they've been going the way Brandon wants. <laughs> oh man. Oh. Okay. So anyway, back to Kaladin. So while Moash show, sh- has showed up, Kaladin, meanwhile, is now fighting Leshwi. And they're chasing each other around like... Crazy. Yeah, like little hummingbirds or something. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, some better metaphor. I think hummingbirds I is a good metaphor, if only because my grandparents have a <laughs> hummingbird feeder in their backyard. And the way they fight is hilarious. Mm-hmm. And they don't move in any way that makes any sort of sense. <laughs> right. And they sort of do that side to side motion that they're capable of doing as, as wind runners and heavenly ones. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think hummingbirds. Hey, welcome actually. Texas blade to the, to the chat. Um, but yeah. And then they have a moment where they stab each other at the same time. And, like, and they're the having shoulder, like a staring right? like, contest. get a room. My goodness. <laughs> like they're having a staring contest. They lean in and it's just like, you know, they're, they're basically playing fold? chicken with each other. Oh, man. And then they both pull back at the same time. 
Mm-hmm. And then they, creepy nightcrawler pops stop. in. You stop. <laughs> no, yeah, was, like, I thought it was it was some something that they sensed that made them stop. I thought it was. I thought it was they heard the, something that they heard the screams. Maybe he was hearing it. Oh yeah, that's right because the because something creepy nightcrawler shows up and he's attacking civilians. Yeah, and they're screaming and. And I thought it was interesting because you know Kaladin looks. He's like, I gotta go. And Leshwe gives him a look. She's like, Go fix this. It's like, Which, I again, like is just like, okay, that's something very special about the Heavenly Ones. These yeah. Heavenly Ones are presented very differently from the way we saw them in Oathbringer. Because you know, okay. in Oathbringer, we just see them as savage. Okay, here, here's oh, yeah, the line scary. that I love, because it's, uh, Kaladin felt a burning anger. This fused went after civilians. He heard an angry-sounding hum beside him. Leshwe had drifted near, <laughs> closer than he should have let her get, but she didn't strike. She watched the fuse in his army sol- his, of his soldiers below, and the sound of her angry humming intensified. She looked at yeah. to him and then nodded towards the fuse and the unfortunate people. He understood the gesture immediately. Go, stop him. Yeah. Yep. So that's another um, instance that we've seen of there being disagreements within Odium's ranks. You know, we've seen... Was it Syatanat or is it Reshafir? I can't remember which Syatanat one Syatanat is. is the... Yeah, Syatanat, yeah. you know, has expressed discontent with the way things are going. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we see that the orders of Fused don't necessarily agree on things. It's really interesting to see that there is some discord within... Well, it makes perfect sense because we race. know there's discord between the Knights Radiant as well. The only mm-hmm. difference is the Knights Radiant had they used to have honor to guide them but as honor slowly started losing himself they lost mm-hmm. the the connective tissue they have odium to lead them but odium can't be as direct as he would like mm-hmm. and on yeah. top of it all he can't he can't watch everything at the same time well plus he is the embodiment of either hatred or passion more hate more but you know, and it's just like both of those are kind of they they they, they are don't not, they're not conducive to working cooperation. together well cooperation yeah, yeah. they're absolutely no. absolutely and so it's just really interesting seeing that there is some some discord within the ranks on Odium's side yeah well you get the if if the we have the correct read on Leshwe that that whatever their order is about it seems to be mm-hmm. about challenge and proving yourself Mm -hmm. they would look down on this very utilitarian when it all costs style that nightcrawler dude is doing because that actually sounds like the uh edge or not edge dancers else callers ideal kind of i just from his powers it kind of makes me think of dust bringers but i don't know Mm -hmm. for sure well, his powers are like else collars. I think they've they compared right. it to yeah because it's oh. like the surge of transportation. Because he teleports. oh, I guess that's true. Well, he doesn't quite teleport. He he moves super fast. He and moves like changes. His he body. teleports his consciousness. And yeah, creates and then like new a, bodies. A, a body <laughs> forms there. It's like the much more painful version of teleportation. Because he leaves like <laughs> a husk. teleportation. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, and that one like dissolves away or whatever. Yeah, it's, it's creepy. Yeah. Um, so anyway, Kaladin heads off and confronts him and suddenly his stormlight powers just go. And well, disappear. yeah, they, he, he goes into the room and Syl's not happy about him going into the yeah. burning, the, the house is burning on like the top story and he's going into the ground floor. Well, Kaladin knows it's one of those Kaladin knows that he's stepping into a trap. He just doesn't but realize what kind I, of trap I, I totally yeah. thought of Endgame with, with Cap, Iron Man and Thor at the end. It's like, you know, it's a trap, right? Yeah, I don't much care. Good. Then we're all on the same page. (laughs) Uh, Of course, Um, then, because he's just like, you know, I have my weapons. I can do all this surge binding if they try and trap me. And of course, immediately what they do is they take away his powers. But I love that they immediately (laughs) underestimate him. Yes. Just like, oh, you, you, you you surge binders, you know, without your powers, you're nothing. And then he just takes them off. The next line, he cuts them off and he just like, bam, he just runs into one of them and he takes his spear and takes out like two or three of them in quick succession. (laughs) And it's one of these things where he's this, whoever Nightcrawler dude is, he, 
he's used to fighting. He's fought, you know, surge binders for millennia. And mm-hmm. so he knows he has a certain idea of what a surge binder is. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, but no, Kaladin's a little bit better. Kaladin by himself took on a shard bearer and oh, won yeah. with a spear. Mm-hmm. And so he's like, Haha, it's not like you could do anything. It's just like, yeah, about that. <laughs> Plus, yeah. the Surge Binders they fought are a very different breed because these are come from a world that has gone a thousand years without yeah. a desolation. These mm-hmm. are ones who have, rather than being trained up by the Heralds, have had to build their own thing. And so suddenly all of the expectations that the Fused have built which are built around radiants who are trained by the heralds are completely different. Yeah. Everything is, everything is different. Everything is circumvented. Mm-hmm. And uh, so you can't really expect because they, they weren't trained by the same people over and over. So they don't know what to expect. Yeah. And it was, it was the, the soldiers that he has with him in the, in the house or the ones that he told to get lost. And, mm-hmm. and he's like, I'll spare you. And then it gets, <laughs> and then he's, he's he's pretty disappointed when he realizes they're the same ones that they got reenlisted in to help. Yeah, they Nightcrawler. don't listen. Well, it's also no. he as a, his nature as a wind runner is he wants to he wants to spare people. Like he doesn't. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's not. He doesn't want to kill. Yeah, it's not it's not his goal, and so it's really rough for him to have spared someone and have that kindness spat back at him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But um, also in their shoes, I ain't saying no to this guy. He's he's creepy. Oh no! Mm-mm. Yeah, I'll take my That's chances with the witch runner. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, now Kaladin is apparently able to score a hit on the fused because before he's it teleported teleports. too many times. Before well, like, he's, it teleports, he's yeah. like waiting for him, and that mm-hmm. then he has a knife and he gets him that way. Yeah, and that actually is a permanent or semi permanent cuz he'll come yeah. back again. Yeah. But. And so it's just like so if you can hit him before he teleports, you can kill him. I want to read. There's a weakness. I want to cuz this was such a good scene. Kaladin <laughs> kept moving almost without thought, spearing the fourth soul through the neck. There, Kaladin thought as he expect as the expected ribbon of red light came darting towards him, he will go for my back again. Kaladin dropped his spear, pulling a throwing knife off his belt. He turned and ran the knife right into the air right before the fuse appeared slamming the small blade into the creature's neck, angled between two pieces of carapace. The fuse let out an irk of shock and pain, <laughs> his eyes wide. Firewood snapped overhead, and burning cinders dropped down as the enormous fuse toppled forward like a felled tree, the floorboard shaking with the impact. Blessedly, no red ribbon of light rose from him this time. Ah. Yeah. So Kaladin's now taking on a surge, <coughs> uh, a, a, a shard bearer, and now a fused without any powers and mm. one as now the legend wonder, of Kaladin storm blessed <laughs> grows. Now what I wonder is if Kaladin had scored a hit and then it had teleported, would the new body that formed be wounded or would it be a, would it be a fresh body? I don't know. Or I mean, it may not even be able to move if it's that wounded. Like, I, I don't know. I don't well, know, I mean, I like, even if it's just a wound, you know. So like you're asking, he, essentially, if the teleporting connect is a form of healing, almost like yeah. uh, if you play Overwatch Tracer's uh, Rewind. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It, it, just an interesting. Yeah, thought. I don't know. Yeah, anyway, I so, have to see. I'm sure we'll see more of the Nightcrawler type. Now, have we met Godeki at all before? No, no, he's. OK, he's so not he's a new character, newly introduced edge dancer. Yeah, this because before this it was just a lift, mm-hmm. and so Kaladin rescues him, and uh, and well, then of course like we see Rashon. Well, no, even and, even even before that, he sees Godeki getting like moved away. Yeah, he's by sort lift, of dra- dragged off, and he has Lift take the the Void Light device. Uh huh. I love so that the line the Kaladin hadn't seen Lift sneak into the room, but then again, she <laughs> often showed up where no one expected her. Yep. Like in the cognitive realm. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so excited to see more lift. I hope she oh, gets, yes. I hope we get more lift interludes. I'm in sure. I'm sure we will. It'll be great. Cause I feel like lift after a year is going to be a very interesting character. Oh yeah. I mean, cause we do already have the one scene that's out about her making like the little nest and stuff. 
mm -hmm. in like the air ducts or something. I don't remember that scene. I can't remember where I found it. I will. I will see if you can. Yeah, if you find that, send it to me because I don't remember that. I, what I may have missed that. It's a. It's like a lift interlude, and she, she's talking about in, getting too big about things and different. Oh, stuff, that vaguely sounds familiar. I don't remember. So I'll. I'll see if I can find it. It might have been in a newsletter. It might be in a newsletter like Texas Blade is saying, but I'll. I will. Yeah, check I'll. I'll need to check that. Out. I'd forgotten about that. I do. I do vaguely remember that. I do. I loved that scene. I have to find it again. Um, it anyway. but yeah, I'm very interested to see more about lift. Um, and so, yeah, she takes the, the Fabriol with her because they're just like, Navani's going to want to see this. And, and we don't want to leave this here anyway. And this is not something we want them to have. So let's. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we don't want them to have essentially the. Nerfing it, was, it was the leecher cube that yeah. they used in uh, Era 2. Mm. Yeah, I of course. See, yeah. yeah, it's basically a copper. Because wasn't it a copper Fabriol? Didn't it mention something about that, or is that in a later? Uh, I don't know. No, it I doesn't. Be, it doesn't. He doesn't know what it's made out of. Okay, but um, <laughs> that might be in the future chapter. When of uh, yeah, I think that may be a chapter. Sorry, I'm trying not to jump ahead. It's, it's yeah. probably a Bonnie scene. Um, but if you're reading the books, reading the chapters as they come out, you know what I'm talking about anyway. So, um, and then Kaladin sees Rashon, <laughs> and I love that he thinks to himself. So long as it is right, calling back to the third oath. Yeah, he I will protect he the, even yet. those I hate. No, so long has, as it is right, he hasn't seen him. He hasn't seen him, but he but Lyft describes him and says that that's because there were two. Oh, people. She said there happened? were two people who. Yeah, there were two people okay. who went in. And then Basically, he knows Nikki, he's going then, to to save Rashon. And so he's like, "Oh crap, it's it's Rashon." Right, because Kaladin hesitated, and then still mm -hmm. gave him a look, <laughs> and he and he thinks to himself. But I love the way that Brandon portrayed that. As he just he closes his eyes. So long as it is right, and he's like, I, I made myself. this oath. Yeah, and yeah, just I just oh, it's so good. Is it? Look, Rashon is the source of most of the pain in his life. Oh yeah. Well, to the point where he's also the reason that Moash left. Yeah. yeah. And it's just like, dude. Well, it's, it, oh, it gets so back to the whole thing that we've always said about Moash is he's completely understandable, his rage. Mm -hmm. and, Absolutely. And the issue is the whole Moash wants justice. And it's like, yeah. And but Rashon they got... has done despicable things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, he's not going to attack the guy who committed all those atrocities years ago. He's going to attack mm -hmm. a guy who's also had a bunch of other experiences after that. And, and, and is, it looks like now is finally trying. And to be Kaladin better. has to recognize it's not a justice for me to dispense. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. It's, well, and, oh, there, it, well and it's also, there's other concerns going on. Maybe like he's fully justified if he felt, you know, he wanted to kill him, but at the same time, the other people need him right now. And mm -hmm. is it, is it justice for them for me to get justice for this? True. Yeah. And it's, it's be and interesting it, to and see. It, well, it's Kaladin's big problem that he had at the end, or like at the end of part one of Oathbringer, where he's now seeing all sides of this conflict and all the thing, and it's messing mm. him up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because the world is so many shades of gray and so many conflicting problems. It's just like, okay, I say I want to protect everyone. What does that even mean? Right. Yeah. No, it's a really interesting. And then, of course, the chapter ends because Brandon knows bum, bum, exactly bum. when to end a chapter. <laughs> yes. Oh, man. You know, I think this I was, book's going to be pretty good. Yeah, yeah I think, I, yeah. I think you know, this might even, you know, he might be able to sell this to a publisher. I think so, too. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think this Brandon Sanderson guy might take off. One of these days. I think it's a, he's, he's an author to watch. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we do love hearing from our listeners. So please keep sending us your questions. You can ask us about the Cosmere. You can drop us your idea for topics you want us to discuss during the show. And while you're at it, we would love to hear your feedback about how you think we're doing as well as any interesting theories you might have about what's going on in the Cosmere. You can send all questions and suggestions in a brief, concise email to Cosmere studies at gmail.com. And we will hopefully read it as part of the show, particularly in two weeks. If you have questions for Isaac Stewart, 
send them to us at Cosmere studies at gmail.com and we will put them in the running for questions that we ask. We want to ask the questions you want answered. Um, so make sure to send those to us. Um, if you would prefer to send us a physical letter, we do have a PO box at the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere studies, PO box nine, seven, zero, zero, six, three, or Utah, eight, four, zero, nine, seven. Now, outside the podcast, we do each have our own personal projects. Jordan, why don't you get us started off and let us know what you have been up to? Uh, well, normally this is where I tell people about uh, twitch.tv slash splice stream, but instead I want to tell people about the meal I had earlier today uh, <laughs> because uh, Bill was kind enough to, to let me have some of his HelloFresh. And this was a red letter day, folks, let me tell you, because uh, in this meal was a uh, cooking of broccoli it is the first time I've ever actually enjoyed broccoli on any level. I normally retch at it. So this is a red. I ate a vegetable today, and that's uh, that's <laughs> rare. So we need to celebrate this fact. I but am a hero today. Yeah. So, But if you're not interested in my vegetable eating, then you should instead watch uh, Amiibo Fights, where Peach throws vegetables at other Amiibo, <laughs> and thus, boom, ties together. He's a pro. Cool. Um. And Amy, how about you? Where can we find you outside of the podcast? So my Facebook is Coincidence Cosplay and Props. My Twitter is at Coincidence Cosp. Why? Because my name is too long. Ah. You got to give me that pause, Bill. <laughs> my Instagram is at He just wanted to know so badly. <laughs> I was eager. Hey, hey, I'm talking here. Um, that's my terrible New York accent. <clears throat> anyway, my Instagram is at coincidence underscore cosplay. And my website is www.coincidencecosplay.com. And I'm slowly trying to make that website better. Um, cool. so I, I actually right now have been trying to do like most of this month. I missed the past few days, do a, a month long challenge for, it's by, uh, an Instagram thing called she prop, she prop mm -hmm. challenge anyway. And it's doing like, here's a cosplay part that you had to redo. Here's your favorite one. This is like your one that you really like this part, or here's a detail thing. And you, and just have a different prompt for every day of the month. Um, and I got, I got featured once. So that was pretty cool. Um, That's pretty cool. What does yeah, this have to do um, with sheep though? She prop. Oh, <laughs> two words. See, I'm thinking together. Ship -pop, ship -pop. Anyway, I thought it was the sheep. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, but I am, other than that, I am trying to, uh, fulfill a giant order of dice for the, the local game store um, that they need a refill on all their dice. So I'm trying to make a bunch of dice right now. And I'm going to try and work on Vin, my Vin costume, and finish up all my stuff, which I keep saying I'm going to keep trying to do. And my D&D &D rogue, and that's kind of what I'm doing. And I made, I made a little dragon to go with my Kitty Pride one. I just need to make magnets that attach to me so I can nice. attach Lockheed to my shoulder. Hey, Amy, so I have a cute. question. Yes. Who put the bop in the bop she prop she prop? Bop, bop, bop. I don't know. But my it's apologies. Just <laughs> anyway, when I'm not here, I do have another podcast with my friend Dylan all about board games. It's called The Innkeeper's Table. And new episodes come out on Friday mornings. Uh, you can find it on pretty much all the major podcast sites. So go ahead and take a listen to us there. You can also check out our Instagram page at Innkeeper's Table Podcast. We have a direct link to the audio there as well. Um, our most recent episode was a spotlight on the game Half Truth, which is an unexpected collaboration between Ken Jennings of Jeopardy fame and Richard Garfield, the creator of Magic the Gathering. Don't I did not Robo -Rally. expect that. That yeah. And Robo Rally. That's very important. <laughs> did you, Bill? Did um, you know that uh, the reason that Richard Garfield made Magic the Gathering was so he could get enough money to pay for baking Robo Rally? You know, I heard that somewhere. I don't remember where. This it's is a joke for like a total of seven people. <laughs> and I, all seven and of, of those them seven, are really like, enjoying I don't it right now. It's yeah. really important. Uh, our next episode coming up is uh, going to be about storytelling within the context of board games. Both storytelling by the players, storytelling by the game creators, and just sort of how stories work within board games. Um also, if you're a fan of board games and Brandon Sanderson, they are currently in the middle of a Kickstarter for an expansion for the Reckoners board game. Guys, I was done with Kickstarter for a while. I was like, I had finished all of them. All of them had closed out. I was ready to be done. And then they announced a Kickstarter for this expansion. I'm just like, well, dang it. <laughs> so I've got a new Kickstarter that I'm following. <laughs> 
Um, I do have a review of the original Reckoners board game, as well as several others over on www.innkeeperstable.com. And I post about games on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram over at at Innkeeper's Table. For those of you who want to support the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies podcast, but you can't become patrons just yet for whatever reason, we'd love it if you and your would just let your friends know about the show. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and don't forget to like and subscribe over on youtube.com slash Cosmere Studies. All right, guys, final thoughts about these two chapters that we have discussed and what we expect to see moving forward. Kaladin, Leshwi, ship it. <laughs> All right, I've got Jordan on board. <laughs> well, no, I actually was already on board before the episode started. If oh, really? You look to your, if you look to the left uh, picture there, I actually uh, already put that oh, there. So, oh, that's awesome. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Why well, I chip it. Love yeah. it. Anyway. Anyway, I, I, I liked all the stuff with Eli. It was kind of interesting to, to see her in such a diminished capacity and see all the mental dancing and stuff they were doing between her and the three. Is it, mm-hmm. Or what is it called? Yeah, the three? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. the three. Um, at a certain point, she's starting to sound like a really weird WWE tag team. <laughs> Gonna tag in. It's my turn now. The three. The three. What's the three cooking? Nah, it doesn't sound- <laughs> Um, no, that's The Rock. That's a different member of a different tag team. <laughs> oh, right. Sorry. Sorry. Anyway, but I was also really glad to see We Aiden will get him the story. for book five yeah. to put that in. I swear it's going to happen. We must make it occur. <laughs> Wrestling scene right now. I don't like seeing Moash here. This no. does not bode well. This does not bode well at all. talking about? Very, Things have gone so well in poorly. scenes where Moash has been. Make recently. him go never. away forever. Things never go well or never go wrong when he's there. Mm. Oh, man. Mm. Well, in addition to the live episodes of the show that stream on twitch.tv slash innkeepers table every two weeks on Monday nights at 7.30 p.m. Pacific time, 10.30 p.m. Eastern, listeners can find our videos on YouTube or audio versions of the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and just about any other service that carries podcasts by searching for Cosmere Studies. You can also follow us and contact us through Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under the profile at Cosmere Studies. And please, if you have questions that you would like us to ask Isaac Stewart when he's on the show in two weeks, make sure to send those to us and include the word Isaac in the subject line. Like I said, for our next episode, Isaac is going to be joining us for a chat about the Cosmere and other things. So be sure to join that discussion in two weeks on October 5th at 7.30 p.m. Pacific Time, 10.30 p.m. Eastern at www.twitch.tv slash innkeeperstable. Until then... On behalf of Amy, Jordan, and myself, thanks for listening. And remember, there's, there's always, always another, another secret. secret.